As a church body, we have been going through this series known as The Greatest Story, and then Hannibal has uh, been helping us see that the scriptures are broken into four chapters that basically tell the entire story. Um, it goes from creation to fall to redemption to restoration. And so we're in the false uh, section of the story, and we're going to end that section uh, today. Um, and in order to end it, we got to deal with the subject that Paul is writing about in Romans 1 and 2. In 2009, there was a Presbyterian pastor that the local paper went uh, to this pastor in Charlottesville, Virginia, and wanted to know kind of like what questions people were asking him about culture and life and that sort of thing. And so he said, well, the, it used to be that people would come and they would ask the question, is there a God? And he said, but over time, it has changed and there aren't questions anymore. There's basically a statement. And the statement that is made to him over and over again is what I know about God, I don't like. When you hear that, it might be striking and you might go, man, that is just, that's awful. And yet, when we start to deal with the subject of wrath, you start going, well, there's times when I don't like that. I don't like that part of God. Wrath is hard. The subject is hard. In fact, uh, every Tuesday morning as a staff, we, uh, we spend time praying together. Uh, we pray for you, our church family. We pray for one another. We spend some time in worship. And there's times when we're taking that opportunity, that 45 minutes together, that whoever's leading staff prayer at that time will uh, get up and they'll say, okay, we're gonna take a little bit of time for some verbal praise to the Lord, out loud responses. But you have to start with the phrase, I thank God for. And soon it gets started and you start hearing voices around the, the room and people start saying, I thank God for his kindness. I thank God for his love. I thank God for his graciousness. And I thank God for his generosity. And not one time have I ever heard anybody in our staff prayer say, I thank God for his wrath. You probably hear have a similar situation, that you've never thought about it and have never said there, sat there and gone, Man, I thank God for wrath. It's not like you woke up this morning going, man, today just feels like a good day for wrath. <laughs> but that's what's happening here. See, we don't like the thought of wrath. It's a concept we want to stay away from, and yet it's a concept of truth that we have to understand. See, Paul takes time in this text that we read to talk about wrath. It, this, this is actually one of the most neglected doctrines in the Bible. Most uh, churches don't even like to talk about this because we like God's kindness, we like God's love. But God's wrath makes us feel uncomfortable. And we know we're a culture that if somebody starts to feel uncomfortable, we want to make them comfortable as quick as possible. And yet, we see that Paul dives right in. If you look at Romans 1.18, you see he starts and starts putting that word out there, for the wrath of God. If you jump ahead to chapter 2, verse 5, he starts using the word wrath again. But through these 25 verses we read this morning, what we end up seeing is that there are different terms and expressions that are used about wrath. He is jumping all in. And the reality for you and I today is that we have to understand that there is no gospel truth. There is no gospel unless there is God's wrath. They go together. Gospel means good news. And for it to be good news, it means that we have to be rescued from something awful. And so God's wrath and the gospel message go hand in hand. 
So we're gonna journey through chapter one and two together, and there's a main idea that I want you to understand about God's wrath, and it's simply this. No matter your opinion, the wrath of God is just and it's needed. Now notice, I'm putting it out there. I actually don't care what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. The wrath of God is just and needed. And I know that because that's what Paul is talking about. So let's dive in. We're going to look at it through uh, basically three aspects of this. We're going to uh, clarify God's wrath. We're going to look at the case for God's wrath. And then we're going to look at the cure for God's wrath. So we're going to deal with the hard part in the beginning. So let's start with clarifying God's wrath. Let's jump in. To start with God's wrath, we have to um, basically define and say, what does it mean whenever the scriptures talk about God's wrath? What, what is it that, uh, what that is taking place? Maybe you've heard this, you've been around, or um, because I'm not gonna say this is any of you, but you have seen a parent dealing with a disobedient child. Now, we don't have any disobedient children in here, but you've seen it. And there's this phrase that sometimes parents use of, if you don't shape up, you're going to feel my wrath. Or maybe you're at work and somebody um, is talking with you and they say, yeah, so-and-so is just trying to avoid the wrath from management. And see, when we are using terms in that way, what we most of the time associate wrath with is the term anger. But when we are looking at wrath and we're looking at what's taking place, it's not the same when you're talking about it in terms of connecting to God. We can't just define it that way. We have to understand that there's actually several thoughts when it comes to the wrath of God. The first thing that we have to understand is that when Romans is talking about the wrath of God, it doesn't mean that God has uncontrolled anger. This God that we've worshiped is not a God that's just flying off the handle all the time. It's not a God that is like you and me that has this burst of anger that comes out and it's just uncontrolled. In fact, you might not know this, but the New Testament that we're reading from uh, that Romans is in, that was written in Greek, in the Greek language. And there's two terms that are used when it comes to expressing the word anger. The first one is thumos. Thumos is where we got our words thermometer and thermos, okay? And whenever thumos is used in a text, it's basically saying that there is red hot anger, that there is an anger that's jumping out and there's gonna be like a brawl that goes down. I mean, fists are gonna fly, people are angry and they're gonna go at each other. It's absolutely uncontrolled. It's, it means that you have lost control of the situation in, that you're in and you just burst. That's thumos. But that's not the term that Paul uses here. Paul actually uses a term, a, a word that's known as orge. Orge is, a, is this word that's used for someone who is settled or abiding in the situation that is around them. That even though there is this room for, for anger, that, it's, that they are very, very controlled. And what's important is that if Paul's using the word orge in this text, he is trying to point out that this is not a God that's gonna fly off the handle and get angry. This is a God that controls his anger and he controls his anger because he is a just and perfect God. There is no sin in him. See, the problem that we have is that when we talk about wrath, when it has to do with one of us or a human being, we have sin. And sin impacts how this wrath plays out. So 
The wrath of God is perfect, it's controlled, and it's just because he is righteous and sin is not present in him. The second thing, though, is that the wrath of God is actually working in tandem with the righteousness of God. So if you have your Bibles, I want you just to look one verse, or actually two verses prior to what we read, starting in verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in verses 16 and 17, the righteousness of God is being revealed. And it's being revealed from the gospel truth, when truth is preached. But then you get to verse 18. And in verse 18, what we see is that there is something else revealed. The wrath of God is revealed. So it means that this righteous God and his wrath are working together. And when they work together, what it does is it makes fools out of those who are basically pushing against truth, pushing against uh, the gospel message, and not having anything to do with it. His righteousness and his wrath work together. Now, the text also says that his uh, his existence, we can, we can say that there are people that at times, and maybe this is you right now, that you just don't believe that there is a God. You're, you're going, I just don't see anything that explains who God is. And yet what Paul writes is he says, no, 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 we don't have an excuse that God in his existence is clear to us each and every day. And what the text says is that he is revealed through creation. The creator God is actually speaking about his existence in this moment right now. The fact that you have air in your lungs is a worship song to that God exists. You woke up this morning and there was this ball of fire that was still in the sky that screams that God's presence is still here. So the existence of God, who he is, is being uh, just shouted from all of nature. And since God is righteously perfect, his wrath comes from a perfect place and his righteousness and wrath is talked about in all of creation. Because all of creation is honoring him. But there's a third thing. Where is God's wrath directed? And if you look, right in the beginning of verse 18, it says, is, your, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So while Paul writes this, he's pointing out that the creator God isn't flying off the handle in anger, but that his wrath is perfect, it's sinless. And because sin is imperfect and we're full of imperfections, his wrath will go towards those who are not living righteous lives, that aren't pursuing righteousness, the ungodly, because the perfect can't be in the presence of the unperfect. See, no matter your opinion, no matter your opinion, the wrath of God is just and needed. Now that's kind of clarifying God's wrath. We need to jump to the case for God's wrath. So why should God even like pour out this wrath? And what we see through these 25 verses is that there is a problem that rises up. And the problem that we find with humanity is not that there's an ignorance of truth. It's not that they are sitting there going, we didn't know the truth. It's actually that humanity knows that there is a truth, knows there is a, a God who is loving, and yet either suppresses it or pushes it out, pushes it away from them. 
And so humanity's problem is that they are just full of rebellion. You and I have rebellious hearts. So like someone presenting an incredibly good case, Paul comes to court and he says, I'm going to present the case that humanity is full of sinful imperfection. Now, again, I am sorry that I am the one that has to bring you this message. There's nothing joyful about saying, you aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. But that's what the scriptures are saying. To remember our place, that we are a a creation of the creator God, but because of sin, we're imperfect. And so Paul lays out what spiritual rebellion does to our human hearts. So I want you to see that. The first thing is that spiritual rebellion leads to suppressing the truth. Look at how he talks about this. He talks about it in verses 18 through 20. He actually uses the term suppress the truth. And notice what he says. He says that the truth is actually known. It has been shown to them. So wherever we go without excuse, we can say God has revealed himself to us. But then what we have to understand is that you, if you are suppressing the truth, meaning that you are pushing the truth down and away from yourself, it means that you, as a human being, can't honor God. See, if, if we're pushing that aside, it means that we can't honor God because you're filling yourself with lies instead of truth. And what that then is the foundation of, it means that you have a worship problem. And I'm gonna tell you, there is nobody different from the person you're sitting next to. All of us in this room have a worship problem. See, we were designed to worship, but we were designed to worship truth. So when we suppress truth, it means that we are aggressively striving to push the truth away. And when we do that, we are going to worship someone or something other than God himself. Now, I I wanna say this. Friend, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're like, I've just found this place to be uh, a welcoming place, I've been coming, I just don't know about this whole Jesus thing. I want you to know that the truth of Jesus is that you are a sinner, that you can only be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And the more that you put that off and and that thinking off, and the more that you are just ignoring that, that little voice that's talking about the truth of who Jesus is, you might be a nice person, but you're suppressing the truth. And when you suppress the truth, you're not gonna honor God. Now you might be going, well, why are you just like, you know, pinpointing me? Just hold on a sec. For the rest of you, you say you're a follower of Christ. And yet, if we spent time sitting together and talking, and you started to share Like, well, this is one of the issues in my life. And you start talking about a sin that keeps coming up in your life. And you're like, but I just, like, I want that temporary gratification. Or I like the way that it makes me feel. Or uh, I like what this is doing. And I know God says that I shouldn't be doing it, but, but I'm just still doing it. What I need you to know is as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are suppressing the truth. You are actually moving closer towards ungodliness and unrighteousness than you are towards reflecting our Savior. Because spiritual rebellion leads towards suppressing the truth. And we all have a worship problem. In fact, anthropologists say that they have not found a tribe of people in the entire world that doesn't worship someone or something. 
So if every person, every people group in the world worships someone or something, it means that there is the possibility that as we suppress truth, as we ignore the truth of the gospel or the truth of scripture and what it says, it means that we are gonna be putting something else in that worship category in our life. It might be a person, it might be a job, it might be your bank account. Sure, you're going, well, I've never created a golden calf. No, you just created your bank account to be your idol. Spiritual rebellion leads to suppressing the truth. But it goes on, and, and Paul ends up saying that spiritual rebellion leads to the deification of humanity. So we find this in verses 22 and 23. He ends up saying, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged, notice that word, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So what ends up happening is this verse is telling us, actually the verse right before it says that their hearts became darkened. So as they're suppressing truth, their heart becomes dark. And whenever the scriptures talk about the heart, what they are talking about is basically the whole of humanity, the whole of the person. So it means your mind, your body. And so what Paul's saying is their hearts became darkened. And the moment their heart became darkened, they started thinking in different ways and doing different things. Now what's fascinating is if you were to go back to Genesis chapter one and two, you see this beautiful story of creation. It's a beautiful story. It's actually more fun than the story we're talking about. And it's this, you know, God ends up speaking things and things come into existence and solar systems are placed and animals are created and all of it is so cool. And then you get to the pinnacle and the pinnacle of creation is the creation of mankind, Adam and Eve. And what's beautiful is it was, they were the pinnacle because they were the ones that were above everything else and they had the ability to have this relationship with the creator God. And then we know something happens. Sin comes. And what happens is that what what then kind of runs through all of humanity is that we want to use the gifts that are given to us by God, but we aren't willing to worship him. So you're like, yeah, I have these gifts that God's given me, but uh, aren't I great? I mean, that's what ends up happening. So when we are using the gifts, but we're promoting ourselves, we end up setting up a new idol in our life, and it's the idol of me. And I'm gonna tell you, all of us in this room, all of us watching online, all of us have the idol of me that is still creeping up in our life. Because spiritual rebellion leads to us setting up new gods. So let me just ask you, what are you worshiping? What is it that you personally are worshiping? Not what anybody else is, not what your spouse is, or your significant other, or your kids, or your parents, or whatever. What are you worshiping? And are you pursuing worship of the God that deserves all honor and all glory. But spiritual rebellion, Paul says, leads to some other things. And he ends up saying the spiritual rebellion leads to corrupting the divine design. So look at verses 24 through 25. It says, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So what ends up happening is that, you know, we, we start changing things in this world. And we're all smart in this room. We know what's taking place here. 
But what we don't understand is that when we think of wrath, we often think of harsh battles. If I would, were to ask you to write down a definition of the word wrath, we would probably say something about harsh battles, like physical engagement with somebody, like these afflictions that are gonna come upon someone else. But we actually don't see that in this text. We see something different. Notice what the text says. It says, God gave them up. Now, that is an important phrase. If you underline in your Bible, and you should, you should underline that phrase. God gave them up. Because what's happening is God is active, and he's being active by removing the restrictive restraints and he's, he's removing these restraints so that sinners end up reaping the fruits of their rebellion. He's just quietly removing those restraints. So the text goes on then in verse 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So what ends up happening, I've often wondered if you ever spend time reading through the Bible, um, and you get to the book of Leviticus. One, I'm gonna tell you, it's really hard to get through the book of Leviticus, okay? But there are so many strange things that God lays out of what, uh, what his chosen people should not do. And you're like, why would he even have to say this? And then we get to Paul in Rome. And humanity is doing all of them. And so he ends up, he starts talking about this sexual sin that's coming in. And what God does is he removes the restraints for mankind to pursue their lustful ways. Now, I want you to know this. God is not abandoning mankind. He's just removing the restraints to allow them to do whatever their sinful hearts please. Now, this is why we have to understand what sin is. Friends, sin is a virus. It's a virus that spreads and it takes its toll on your entire being. You might be saying, you know what? I don't look as good as I once did because I'm getting older and I'm not spending as much time at the gym. And I'm gonna tell you, that might be like a little bit right, but you're not looking that way, that great way anymore because sin is actually taking a toll on your body. We live in a fallen world. We're breaking apart. And sin is constantly bombarding us and it's uh, invading. So when Paul talks about the sin here in these shameful acts, what he is doing is he's saying, you are continually stepping into these practices of dishonoring your body. It's not a one-time thing. You're continuing to do it over and over and over and over. And he's saying it's spiritual rebellion because the virus of sin is impacting every area of your life but he goes on and he says spiritual rebellion ends up leading to the corruption of the mind now look at verse 28 and since they did not um, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God that's kind of like suppressing the truth God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done so just following um, these verses, what we end up seeing is that Paul takes uh, and talks about this sexual sin and, and how man and woman were created a certain way in the garden. And now they have completely distorted it. And then he ends up listing all of these other sins. And he does it for a reason. Because for many of us, we would read that and go, Praise the Lord, 
that's not me. I'm not committing those sexual sins. Praise the Lord. And then you read the other list and you're just like, oh, shoot. Well, I am kind of jealous of my friend. Kind of greedy. I wish my bank account was a little larger. And you start reading through those and you start realizing that all those other sins actually are part of invading the mind and it changes our thinking. And so he ends up writing this and it takes us back to what was happening in verse 21 where it says that they knew God. So what was happening is that they had the ability to know God and spiritual rebellion changes their thinking and we start end up basically saying anything is possible because God is kind. And because God is kind, then our opinion of how culture can be is okay. And he says, the thinking, the thinking goes completely off the rails. Because when truth is rejected, it leaves its mark. Friends, if you're going to be wise, I mean wise in every area of your life, it's gonna be because you aren't rebelling against the truth of the gospel. You are chasing after it every day. And you're saying, this is the truth I need. But he goes on. And there's one last thing that he ends up listing. That spiritual rebellion leads to self-righteous indifference. Look at uh, chapter two, verse one. It says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now, what he ends up saying here, it's not that he's saying you can't judge things. What he ends up saying is that scholars believe that the first section in chapter one, he is revealing this to those in Rome, to Gentiles, not God's chosen people, the Jews. But then he also knows how Jews end up looking at Gentiles. And he just, he knows that the Jews are gonna look at the Gentiles and go, they are so wicked. They aren't God's chosen people like we are. They don't follow the Old Testament law like we do. But he ends up, Paul lists all those other things because he's saying, no, 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 faith is what matters to God. It's not your nationality, your gender, your race, or anything. It is faith that determines whether you are a spiritual rebel or a follower of Christ. So what we have to understand is that God sees the heart. Like there's a bunch of hidden stuff, even with all of us in here. And the only one that can see it is God. He sees the heart. He knows that we have this tendency to be self-righteous. And he's saying, no, 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 no. We all are spiritual rebels. We all deserve the wrath of God. Now that leads to, well, what is the cure for God's wrath? See, wrath comes in various ways. But when we read it here, the truth of wrath, the the wrath of God, is that it isn't a violent expression. It's not like this violent expression of his displeasure of humanity. It's a quiet withdrawal of his presence. Did you wake up this morning understanding that the biggest blessing that you have is not anyone else in your life or, or like your bank account or your job or any of those things, the biggest blessing in your life is that, that actually the presence of God surrounds you? See, that, that's why we come and worship. His presence is here right now. And so the presence of Jesus in your life is truth, it's hope, it's love, it's grace, and it's nourishment to live in a fallen, sinful world that has the wrath of God upon it. 
And so if you would, just for a minute, jump, turn the page to Romans 3. And this is where Paul then paints the picture of the cure. And so he ends up saying in, uh, verse, uh, in verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So it means that that righteousness of God only comes through faith in him. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. See, something powerful happens when you surrender your life to Christ. Because our lives actually demand that wrath deals with it. I mean, we come into this world deserving wrath from the moment we breathe, from the moment we are conceived. We have wrath upon us because we are a sinful people. But it's not a wrath that is always violent. Sometimes it's that quiet withdrawal of his presence. Do you remember the crucifixion? You know, we tend to think that that loud noise of a hammer hitting a nail and going through hands and feet was the most painful thing that Jesus experienced. But that's not it. See, the most painful thing he experienced was the quiet withdrawal of God's presence. See, Jesus on the cross, right at the end, before he breathed his last last breath, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's in that moment that God turns his back because he can't see all the rebellion that is on his son's shoulders as the most glorious kindness and graciousness that could ever happen was Jesus taking the wrath that you and I deserved upon himself. See, his presence left and the wrath came. But Sunday came, and Jesus rose, and hopefully you know the story. On the third day, he rises from the grave, and he, he exits that grave, and he says, I have defeated death so that those who follow me can have life and flee spiritual rebellion into the arms of my gracious Father. Absolutely. See, the gospel demands that there's wrath. And the gospel demands a decision. And so no matter my opinion, your opinion, The wrath of God is just and is needed. And the gospel is your cure. So if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, my prayer is is that today would be your day. If you wanna talk after the service with me, I would love to talk to you. For some of us in here, we are captured by spiritual rebellion. And today is your day to release that to the Lord and to run into the arms of a righteous God. My prayer would be that you do that today. Let's pray. Father, wrath is so tough. We want to think that there 
is nothing like that in this world, and yet there has to be because you desire to rescue us from our sin and ourselves. And so I pray that as we understand the wrath of God a little more this morning, that it would create in us this passionate desire to love you and to worship you passionately in all that we do. So I ask that you would guide us in that. May we be disciples that flee rebellion and run into your arms. And so your name I pray, amen. And church, you may remain seated. Uh, we're gonna sing a new song, it might be new to you, but please pray this song with us and if at any point you learn it, you feel comfortable, feel free to join us in singing and praying this song to the Lord.